We'll start. Good morning, and we're on lesson six. Last week's lesson six was pseudo six, which was lesson five. So we're on lesson six of creation and my views about creation as supported, I think, by scripture. And then we'll talk today specifically about dinosaurs and monsters and sea creatures and such as we started last week and did, I think, quite a bit of groundwork. Uh, I'm told that behemoth is pronounced behemoth, which I think I said, although, well, Derek thinks I said behemoth. So, um, but I, um, I'll pronounce it the way I want to. Thank you. But we'll go with behemoth. And then Leviathan, what did I say? Leviathan? Leviathan? It's Leviathan, right? Yes. Oh, I think it's Leviathan. So that, yeah. Well, <laughs> And uh, so since he's a member of my household, he's allowed to have a name in here. And so, all right, so the, uh, but I'll try to pronounce it right. So today, the trivia question though, so we're on lesson six about creation. We'll do dinosaurs and we'll do my view of dinosaurs is, and then we'll do kind of a question and answer and other issues with um, creation and scripture and how things make sense. And we already have had a question brought up that I think is very, valuable that we'll discuss here in a minute. So you know that the famous passage about a wife of noble character who can find worth more than rubies, who wrote the first portion of that chapter? Since we divide things into chapters, I'll ask a chapter one. Proverbs is Proverbs 31. Yes. So who, who wrote the first portion which is not the same portion as a woman of noble character who can find. No, that's a good answer because we attribute the Proverbs all to Solomon. Solomon did not write all the Proverbs. There were other authors. King, yes, King, King Lemuel. Yes, King Lemuel. Let's look at Gen oh, just, yeah. Proverbs. Well, we'll start Genesis and get to Proverbs 31. Uh, he was okay that'd be great actually yeah because i didn't know that by so the mother of solomon whom i call Bathsheba, yeah okay uh named him lemuel yeah yeah a little yeah interesting so what was the actual name of solomon given by god we've asked that before anybody remember but me the name for Solomon given by God. So anyway, while you're thinking about that, Proverbs 31, the sayings of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him, O son, O son my womb, O son my vows, do not spend your strength on women, you're bigger on those who ruin kings. It's not for kings, O Lemuel, not for kings to drink wine, for kings to cry beer, lest they drink and forget what the law decrees and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. So, and it goes another couple of verses I'll stop there. But King Lemuel, other than my friend on the back row, nobody else knows who that is in history. Yeah. So, the if we go back, though, to the birth, we can tell you the story of Solomon's real name. Other name. Anybody remember? It's a very recognizable Southern United States type name. In my opinion, oh, where was he? He was born over here. <laughs> it doesn't sound very Jewish. It was Second Samuel twelve, uh, verse twenty-four. David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and lay with her. She gave birth to a son. They named him Solomon. The Lord loved him, and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedediah. And so Jedediah was the God-given name for Solomon. I don't think we use that much. I think in the memorization of Old Testament books, Song of Jedediah doesn't have the same raw of the tongue feel as Song of Solomon. So, uh, but it, that was his God-given name. So Jedediah means uh, love by the lord so i think that's um that's pretty interesting that he loved him so much so he named him in a little bit of a different way 
Okay. So as soon as he finds that passage, we're going to go on with dinosaurs. So here's what I wanted to just mention a quick summary of our uh, study so far, because surely five lessons worth could be summarized in two sentences. And that is, I think when we look at creation, I think the days of creation as we see them may well have been different by the way the earth was constructed at the time before rain, back when the God was alive initially, allowing growth, for instance. And then I believe, and just as very quick summary of moving forward to the flood, I believe that when the flood came and water sprang from the ground and came from above, the first rain ever seen, and I believe that the earth was divided from a single land that was mostly called Eden, of which the Garden of Eden was a portion, that then it was divided out, and you can see today that the continent with the continental divide theory that the continents match up plants match up animal life rock structures things like that and i think when they were spread apart that there were depths put into the ocean that were not previously there and fault lines for instance and that mountains were crunched up that were not previously as high as they were i think if you look at the waters of the flood covering 15 feet above the surface of all the mountains that it really makes no sense just from a physiologic standpoint that Noah and his family and the animals could have survived at a height that high with the air that is that thin because it is uh, exceptionally rare. In fact, uh, according to the comments of a class member of yours, only two people have ever made it up to the top of Mount Everest without oxygen supplemented to them. And when people make it up to the top of Mount Everest, if they live, they have to generally have air cancers, oxygen cancers along the way. They get up to the peak, they get their quick picture and their quick look and they get down because they're on the verge of death. And it is exceptionally difficult to think about people living that high and just thinking about molecular structure on the earth. And this is where a little bit a minimal part of science plays a role. But if you just look at the amount of water, that's available on the earth. Water is the ultimate renewable resource because it evaporates and it returns and it freezes and it melts and it, you know, washes from zone to zone, but it doesn't chemically become anything different. And so the amount of water on the earth, I would say, is relatively stagnant, if not absolutely stagnant. And I think just looking at the amount of water on the earth, if water covered the flat, relatively flat land of Eden until there was separation and depth put in the sea and height put on the land, that that amount of water makes sense. I don't think God withdrew some water. Absolutely, he could have. If you would prefer to think that God placed more water in the earth and then withdrew it to some other place or just said, you no longer exist, you H2O molecules here, then all that's fine. I have no problem with your thought on that. But I also think that if we look at the the finite amount of water on the earth and the fact that it is ultimately renewable in its various forms around the earth, that it makes sense that that was uh, the way the flood changed the earth. And then when we see verses about like he was alive at the time the earth was divided, and we'll talk a little more about division and languages and such today briefly. But I want to go back to last week, we were talking about the behemoth and the Leviathan. Did I say it right? Okay. The behemoth and the Leviathan that we read about, if you want to see those verses again, we'll, you know, I'll reference back to last week for that in the interest of time. But let's look at Isaiah 30, and I'll read verses 6 and 7. This is a passage that I had no familiarity with until about maybe 10 years ago when I was starting to study some of this just with interest. And I doubt we cross it much, but I think it's interesting. Isaiah 36, and, and I'll read 6 and 7, an oracle concerning the animals of the Negev, okay? Uh, the Negev being a land uh, that was at times part of Canaan, uh, that this is sort of a desert area, um, the way we would think about the, the view in our minds of the land of Israel that looks, or the land of Canaan, that looks like desert, that's the Negev. It's essentially a, a desert basin. Uh, through, through a land of hardship and distress, of lions and lionesses, 
of adders and darting snakes. The envoys carry their riches on donkey's backs, their treasures on the humps of camels to that unprofitable nation, to Egypt, whose help is utterly useless. Therefore, I call her Rahab the do-nothing. Boy, where in the world did that come from? Well, <laughs> if that's not, you know, a little bit of God's sense of humor there through Isaiah, I think it's, you know, it's kind of fascinating. I call her Rahab the do-nothing. So if you start looking at the history of Rahab in history, it turns out that Rahab is actually a sea monster, somewhat like Leviathan the, in the description, that in history, there are passages of history that talk about a sea monster that was called Rahab. And this is not to be confused with Rahab, the great, great, great grandmother of David. Is that enough? Great, great, great. Great, great grandmother of David, too many greats. Um, or, you know, who was Rahab the prostitute, prostitute in the uh, city of Jericho. Uh, this was a different phrase. And Rahab the do nothing seems to be a strange comment to mean that this uh, uh, was a creature with arrogance. Now, we wouldn't use that phrasing. And that phrasing is kind of a hard uh, interpretation of the Hebrew, apparently that it's unclear what the do nothing specifically means, but the Rahab comment is interesting. So let's look over at Psalm 89. Oh, somebody moved Psalm to the middle of the Bible. Here it is, Psalm 89, 10. I'll start, of course, a little earlier. Let's look at um, verse five. Psalm 89, five. The heavens praise your wonders, O, o Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. O Lord Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south, Tabor and Hermon sing for joy in your name. Your arm is endued with power. Your hand is strong, your right hand exalted. So in the middle of praising God and his strength, uh, Ethan, who wrote this Psalm, much like Proverbs and not all written by a Solomon, not all Psalms were written by David. Uh, he's in the middle of all that says, you rule over the surging sea, you crush Rahab like one of the slain of uh, if you just really want to get into the trivia the second half of the verse with your strong arm you scattered your enemies was actually quoted by mary in the song of mary when she found out she was pregnant by the holy spirit with jesus so it's um um this passage thrown in there does not speak to me of the type of passage that would speak to a an unknown mythological creature and that's part of the argument about you know, behemoth and Leviathan, that those were perhaps just mythological figures. And I personally kind of think not. I think they were real creatures that existed in the sea, made people fearful, and maybe account for some of the bone sets that we find today. And I want to explain that here for a minute. Um, before I say that, I also want to point out that some of the passages, and in fact, even that Isaiah 30, verse 7, where you know he talks about Rahab the do nothing, some interpretations and maybe some of yours actually read dragon there. And so the word dragon does appear in the Bible other than the obvious place of revelation where the red dragon with you know seven heads, ten horns, and such uh, cast the woman or pursued the woman who and was cast to the earth. Uh, dragons appear otherwise, and they're just looking at history. There almost always has been a description, and we read last week in, in uh, Job 41 about the fire, you know, breathing out fire, having breath of fire, um, without the specific word dragon. But when you look in history, there almost always is a figure uh, who is seen as a large beast with either water skills that are immense, like being able to swim everywhere, uh, or uh, dragon 
like features of wings or of mountain dwelling or of fire. And I would reference, if you look back at, like for instance, in Revelation, it's interesting to me that when John described the dragon coming from heaven, that didn't sound like something he could not describe. Another way of saying that would be when John saw the throne in heaven, he said, this is, you know, it was like an immense gold throne surrounded by 24 elders. One was on the throne. It was like uh, a man of gold, a uh, figure of gold, very hard to describe. And a lot of statements of using phrases of had the appearance like uh, the way he then described the figure. Going back similarly to Ezekiel and Daniel, they made very similar statements that there was a, they saw a man that, that was like gold, uh, you know, gold covered and brilliant appearance. I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing that very well. Let's look real quick at Ezekiel just as an example. Um, let's see. I will read. Um, okay, let's look at Ezekiel 1, 4, just as an example. I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, immense cloud of flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. That's more what I'm trying to say. And in the fire is what looked like four living creatures, uh, et cetera. All four had faces, wings, verse 8, uh, verse 10. Their faces look like this. Each of the four had the face of a man on the right, the face of the lion uh, on the left, the face of an ox, and each also had the face of an eagle, et cetera. And um, so then talking about the throne came after that. I won't read all that in the interest of time. But a lot of this description was phrased as, this is a bit hard to describe, and this is the best I can do. When we get to Revelation 12, as an example, I'll turn over there briefly. Revelation 12, uh, 1 through 3, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, cried out in pain. She was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, 10 horns, and seven crowns on his heads. Uh, then, you know, we go down to Verse seven, there's a war in heaven. Michael's angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been, uh, who had given birth to the male child. Verse 17, then the dragon was enraged to the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. And then 13, one, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. All of those give a statement of the dragon without saying a creature like a dragon. So maybe I'm extrapolating that too far, very possible. Uh, but when I look at the phraseology in the Bible, when something is evident as what it is, it is described as what it is. When it is too difficult to explain because it's in the spiritual realm as opposed to the physical realm, there are phrases like this had an appearance like the son of God or the son of man, for instance, in other passages. And I think that they had familiarity with what a dragon looked like. I think that is, you know, this wasn't out of the blue. This was familiarity. If you look back at ancient rudimentary, you know, whether it's cave drawings, flags, fragments of stone carvings, dragons appear in those. You know, they, they, there are numerous uh, flags throughout history that have dragons on them. I think it's interesting that a lot of these large beasts seem to appear, seem to have been um, known to people enough to put them, for instance, on a flag. And uh, the what? Yeah, Komodo dragon. It's interesting because if we then start looking at the comparison of what we view as dragons of reptilian large critters, okay, let's go with that. Um, that's an RLC, a reptilian large critter. The, um, but when you look at reptiles, they have some characteristics in common with the description of behemoth, leviathan, dragon, the way we view them, dinosaur artifacts. And that is they have bones, obviously. They have scales and 
um, shields on them that are uh, on some of the model figures we see of them that look, you know, like say a Stegosaurus uh, with a row of of uh, shields along it. I can't think of the right word, but like armor plating. That's what I'm trying to say. More like armor plating. And so, for instance, let's look at. And last week, I read a section of a historical statement about the brontosaurus that said, you know, there was no neck or head, no tail, no feet, no hip bones, no shoulder bones. And if you think about it, what does that leave? That leaves basically a torso. And think about the torso of what we view as the brontosaurus, the large, huge land animal. And then maybe if there's a huge sea creature like Leviathan, would that have essentially the same torso? And I think that's real possible. I think we may be through the nature of the flood and water springing up from below the ground, water from above, all living creatures dying except those on the ark. I think it's very possible we have misunderstood some dinosaur features for those that were known sea creatures that ended up on land because the water carried them back. Now, I'll give you a little evidence of that, and that is that there are in existence today 14 fragments or large pieces, and there's a whole spectrum from a hip bone to just larger structures of what we call Tyrannosaurus rex. And, you know, I, I addressed last week, I think all the land creatures were plant eating before. We view Tyrannosaurus rex as a carnivore because of the teeth. I don't think there's any real reason to have to view it that way. But uh, the 14 that exist around the world were all found within about 200, well, no, excuse me, about 500 square mile area up around the range of Montana um, to South Dakota, North Dakota, um, Upper Wyoming, that area of North America. If you think about that zone that is very near the Rocky Mountains. So if I'm correct about the land being kind of smashed up as continents moved, and maybe these creatures all being, they're all caught, or all found, excuse me, in a, a basin. It's, they're not up on the mountain. They're like in this plain that is a lower area. Perhaps all those bones kind of came together and settled in that area after the flood. Uh, because of the movement of the earth and such. So maybe that was a regional animal, the way God describes, you be careful or I'm sending this beast on you. And I, maybe the, all 14 of those beasts happen to be in one area, which would make sense anyway. You know, creatures that are alike, say with those that are alike for breeding purposes, et cetera. And so I think that's kind of an interesting bit of information too, looking historically at that. You know, we don't find them widespread throughout the entire earth. And, and that may be part of the reason that, you know, maybe God created certain creatures for certain purposes he had. And then, you know, after the flood, there wasn't that same purpose. More likely, which I think is fair, is that because these were reptilian characters or creatures, they, reptiles, continue to, to grow for their entire life. So when we look at Methuselah living to be 969, let's say there was a crocodile type creature that grew its entire life because it was a reptile and, um, you know, therefore became huge. And then if you want to view, you know, what God do about dinosaurs with the flood, that the, the majority of what have been identified as dinosaur bones by scientists are actually small creatures that are about the size of a sheep, give or take. So we're talking about, you know, somewhere around three feet tall, three or four feet long at the longest. And that wouldn't be hard to fit on the ark the way the ark was designed to fit animals. Similarly, you know, if you had the elephant, you could bring in the younger elephant that wasn't quite as large. If you look at the gestational phase of an elephant, I believe it, and I may be misquoting this, but I think it's 24 months of gestation. And so, and then when they're born, they're fairly big, but they're not the large, large elephant that we view. So if you brought on young animals or young dinosaurs, 
that could fit, I think that makes sense. If then people didn't live as long after the flood, which seems very apparent because nobody but Noah was talked about as living past, say, you know, a normal lifespan the way we view it. After the flood, Noah was said to live 950 years. Nobody else talked about that way. I think with the change in the earth that came about from the rain, from the springing up, from the transfer of the continents and the movement around the earth of land, that that changed the rotation of the earth in some way around the sun or on its axis such that people just could not survive. And maybe it was that canopy we've talked about, the canopy that protected people from sun radiation and aging that was then gone once the rain came. I think that uh, amph uh, not amphibians, uh, reptiles, reptiles would then not live as long and not become as large. And that a lot of the design of dinosaurs that we see in books, pictures, whatever, you know, they're not photographs. They are renditions. And I think if you look at just the brontosaurus with no neck, head, tail, et cetera, that's quite a stretch to say what that creature looked like. And I think we maybe have just flat out misunderstood what the creatures looked like when they were alive. Maybe they looked a lot like some bizarre looking reptiles like the Komodo dragon, that was a bizarre looking creature. And, you know, bearded lizards are weird. They're, they're just, you know, they're odd looking scaled up creatures with little armor plates here and there at times. I was watching actually a little documentary last night for a minute on crocodiles on Lake Nasser, which is part of the Nile River that's been blocked up and made into a lake. And crocodiles, if you look at them, your immediate thought would be, man, this looks like a dinosaur. It's got scales along the back. It's got fleshy area in between. It's got armor on the sides. It's got these, you know, pointed fanged uh, looking feet that are inexplicably small to carry around a, a beast that big, kind of like Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, huge, huge tail that whips things out of the water and tries to kill them and, and uses that for hunting. And of all the fascinating things, the way God created this instinct, this was a crocodile they determined was about nine years old. I guess they asked him before he ate him. <laughs> and the, and uh, the crocodile crawled out on the shore to lay eggs, dug a hole three and a half feet deep, laid the eggs, covered it with sand. I mean, they have video of this, you know, crocodile scooting around, covering it with sand. Then it perches like 30 feet away to watch and to kill anything coming toward its pit. And I just find that to be fascinating anyway, that there's so much instinct involved. But I tell you, every view I saw of that creature, which is an amazing creature, looks very dinosaur-like, you know, just scales everywhere. And, um, you know, I think maybe we've just misunderstood some of the fossil findings that are old and, and changed a bit with, you know, changed to a degree with pressure, rain, uh, flood, other conditions. You know, there are not fully intact skeletons found. That's just the nature of sediment and earth change and, and whatever. And thinking about specifically the Nile, um, you know, the Nile starts up in the Ethiopian mountains, the highlands of Ethiopia, and washes down through many tributaries, 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 that's right. Yeah, my language, man, tributaries, several tributaries, um, go and meet together to form the Nile River. And then a lot of that sediment for years has provided the sort of fertilizer, if you will, the rich soil to be, to make the Nile Basin extremely fertile. And as you, if you remember when Ray Vanderlaan was here, or if you've ever looked at, when you look at the Nile Basin, they're going down through Africa there, if you did like a Google Earth deal, there's like greenery within a few feet of the Nile within, you know, a, a certain distance. And then it's fast desert, completely unvegetated. And so, you know, it's interesting. I think by God's plan, he provided that, uh, that wealth of fertilized soil to keep people alive along the Nile. And then, of course, in the land of, of uh, uh, the land that the Israelites held in. Goshen, I almost said the land of Gideon, the uh, land of Goshen, thank you. In the land of Goshen, you know, it separates out and is even broader, and that's where the Israelites were able to live for their 430 years 
uh, of captivity. And so, you know, it's an amazing process, but all of that is say, if you have a very rich nutritional system, very long living uh, amphibians, you know, I'm not saying the River Nile is the same then as it is now, because it's probably not, uh, not amphibians, but reptiles. I don't know why I keep saying amphibians, but the, uh, if you look at long living reptiles who live their entire or grow their entire life, I think it makes sense. You could find some big reptilian bones. When you find big reptilian bones, it's a very easy thing to extrapolate that to a big creature because it probably was, but I don't think it was a, a big, odd, weird creature that we view the same as the way the world views dinosaurs. And then now that's my view. And then I just want to address two more things on that and then to answer the question that was brought up earlier about some uh, dating mechanisms of the earth. So if you look at earth, the earth with the depth of the ocean and the um, crunching up of mountains on the land and all the sediment that comes about from that, it is fairly easy to look at the stratus, uh, stratus not stratosphere, the, uh, the sediment, sediment layer I'm not saying that right either. Yeah, sedimentary layers, something like that. All right, one of those things. But if you look at sediment layers, you can find where, you know, you can follow a layer through hundreds of miles of land, and it would be relatively easy to say, oh, this layer is, you know, 240 feet deep. So therefore, it must be dated at 5 million or more years. Why? Does anybody know that? I would say no. I don't think anybody knows how long it takes for land that is crushed by water and pushed together and, and raises up in a mountain range, for instance, and plains near it, and then years of rain after that, plant life, animal life, et cetera. I don't think anybody knows how old that layer is, and therefore that's not very reliable dating. So that gets to the question we had earlier about carbon-14 dating. Everybody, I'm sure, has heard of carbon-14 dating. Somebody just tell me, when was the last time you heard about something being dated by carbon-14 dating? Yeah, so occasionally you'll find like a, a relatively modern text because it was handled by relatively modern people, right? And so they try to extrapolate the date based on the breakdown of carbon in that uh, the isotopes over there that is perceived to be broken down at a steady rate so that you could look at, say, my Bible, and, and this is an extrapolation because it doesn't happen this rapidly. Let's say my Bible is uh, published in 1994. Theoretically, you could figure out how much carbon-14 is there and how much has decayed into other carbons and place it around 1990 to 1998 as a, you know, just as an example. If you had somebody that bought one in 2000, they maybe could say, you know, oh, you know, mine, I'll date mine and it's going to end up being 1996, 2004. That overlaps by a couple of years. And if it was in the same area, it may have similar materials. It may have nothing to do with when it came about. And that's part of the problem with carbon-14 dating is it assumes that something is ancient and relatively pure and hasn't been exposed to heat, cold, wind, rain, snow, depth, altitude, and various things that change the rate at which an isotope breaks down. And it ignores the idea that God could have created anything at the age he wished. But if you look at carbon-14 dating, nobody could tell you when carbon-14 began as a non-broken down isotope because nobody was there to measure that. And so inherently, it may be sort of a, a range that you can determine, but it is not in what I would call an exact science because there's no start point, no definite rate of environmental control and no reproducibility. You can't go back and say, I'm going to start this carbon-14 in the Bible project today and measure in 10 years, see what it is and compare that because it doesn't happen rapidly enough. And because the nature of that would be a controlled environment and you don't know what the environment's been for 
say bones up in Montana. And so I think carbon 14 is uh, in my mind, uh, by current standards, a very old fashioned rudimentary technique to try to figure out the way uh, or the age of something on the earth. And again, that's because we have different conditions, different times. And the reason I think you only hear of it now in the setting, uh, like you mentioned about say the setting of a text or a, you know, an artifact found that's relatively recent, like maybe from the 1500s, is because you can compare it to other things from the 1500s that you know about and see how much carbon-14 is there. You cannot use it to extrapolate back millions of years. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you one of the players on the got a they would make up more than the five thousand Um interesting point and her uh, comment was that looking at the ages of people like Methuselah being all 1,000 years old at 969, it's hard to add that up to make sense of the um, uh, BC time frame of about 5,000 years of existence. Let's look at that. Very good question. Let's look at Genesis 5. This is the written account of Adam's line uh, is how it starts. And then Verse three, Adam lived 130 years, had a son in his own likeness and his own image. He named him Seth. After that, he lived 800 years, had other sons and daughters, Adam lived 930 years. When Seth lived 105, then he went down, verse eight, and lived 912. Enosh, 90 years old, at fatherhood, lived 815. Kenan, 70 years, now down to verse 13, lived 840 more years and died at 910. Mahalalel. Lalel lived 65 years, became father of Jared, lived 85 more, lived in 895 total, verse 17. Jared, 162, gave birth to Enoch. Then Jared lived 800 uh, more, lived to be 962. Verse 21, Enoch had lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah, and then walked with God at 365, verse 23, 24. Verse 25, when Methuselah lived 187 years, he became Father Lamech. Uh, he then lived 782 years, and altogether 969. When Lamech lived 182 years, he had a son named Noah, lived 777 years total. When Noah is 500, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then at 600, he entered into the ark. Um, and there was the... the uh, Rain, of course, the whole uh, changing of the earth when the rain first occurred, I believe. And then down uh, to verse 28 of chapter 9, altogether Noah lived 950 years, then he died. And after that, there's not mention of people living a certain length of time. And so I think if you add those up, you actually can go from Adam to Noah in a couple of thousand years. We know from other history in other nations that somewhere around 3000 uh, BC was when other nations came about. I mainly know that because I have a timeline in the front of my Bible and uh, because I wasn't there to witness it, but you can relatively reliably place King Saul at 10, reigning from 1050 to 1010 BC as an example. Abraham born about 2166 BC Moved to Canaan 2091, uh, excuse me, 2091. Yeah, 2091. Yeah, to Canaan. Boy, that number seemed really elusive there for a second. And then um, a uh, traditional early dynastic period of Mesopotamia, which is, as we've talked about, the land of Ur, the Chaldeans, and the lands uh, where uh, Abram and the patriarchs came from can be reliably placed at about 2550 BC. And so if we use other evidence on those dates and then the dates of these uh, patriarchs, I guess would be the right term for them, this lineage from Noah to 
or excuse me, from uh, Adam to Noah, then I think it does add up to about somewhere around 4,000, 5,000, maximum of about 8,000 years BC, plus our 2,000 be about 10,000. I believe, personally, the best reliable uh, dating of the Earth after leaving Eden for Adam and Eve would be about 6,000 BC. Uh, six, I'm sorry, 6,000 years, 4,000 BC. And so I think, though, if you look at the way there perhaps was this canopy over the earth and creation with different length of days that accounted for these guys to live this long, that uh, you could easily add a couple of thousand years to that. I don't think you can add millions or billions. And I don't think there is any evidence for millions or billions. That is purely extrapolation. It's a thought trying to place, you know, the earth back to a Big Bang theory and happenstance. And we're fortunate the amoeba crawled up on shore at some point. Where the amoeba came from is a little elusive. But, uh, and because it didn't happen, I think. I think God placed creatures on the earth as he intended. And so when, when I look at the dates, like that, I believe we can account for those uh, long lives that changed when the flood came. And I think it was because the structure of the earth and the rotation of the earth around the sun likely changed in that time. Now, I have no proof. That's purely my thought, but I think it's a reasonable thought as to how that happened. I also believe that if you look at those dates, and I know we touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but let's say one was, for instance, 182 years old when he gave birth to or when he became the father of a child um that's sort of hard to relate how long that existence would be why that existence was that long before there's a child born if the intent of god was to have people reproduce and fill the earth and i don't know how to account for that length of time unless time was different than the way we perceive it uh or than we know it to be whether it was different in that era than what it is in our era in terms of 365 days around the earth being one year. So uh, looking just at, you know, Adam having Seth at 130 years, you know, certainly there's Cain and Abel before that. And so if you think about that, that if Seth was sort of the replacement child for Abel, because that's what we read in scripture, then why would Seth live 105 years before he became the father of Enosh? And then you have 90 and 70 and 65, and it starts seeming almost logical. And then we get down to Jared at verse 18, living 162 years before he had a child, and Methuselah lived 187 before he became a father. And so I think those dates are just hard to account for, but I do think they account for the earth being somewhere around 6,000 years in age. Oh, yes. The first child? Uh, no, not, there's not a good reason. And that's a great question because if you look, for instance, Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. It sounds like that was their first child, but it's not necessarily a given. That may have only been their most significant child for the lineage. Now, it does seem God always preferred firstborns in terms of picking lineage. Is there any indication that the time changed in, in, uh, in the New Testament? You know, like if time was different in those times? Good, New yeah, time. good question. Um, I would say there is up here, there's evidence, okay, <laughs> that time change. In scripture, it's harder. But if I look at, first, I think it would have changed at the flood, not at the New Testament per se. Um, because I think there's ample evidence that most people lived, most of the kings during this time, and I don't mean just kings of Israel and Judah, but like kings of Persia, King Darius. It was 62 when he became king, for instance, in the book of Daniel, uh, that people lived a more predictable time frame like we live today. And that is, you know, an average currently of 77 years for men and 80 
years for women down a year because of COVID, by the way. It was 78 two years ago and 81 uh, for men and women, respectively. But anyway, having uh, said that, though, I think the average span of people after the flood was somewhere around, you know, 50 to 80 years, I would say is a fair range. In the uh, census of 1900, the average age of men in America at death was 48, and of women was 51. But you also have to count a lot of, you know, children didn't live because of prairie conditions, plagues, and whatever. So that brought that average age down. There certainly were people like Benjamin Franklin, who lived to be, I think, 92. You know, he there were some older people around, but none of them were 900 plus years old by any account, and so. I think after the flood, that because the Earth's rotation, I think the Earth's rotation literally changed because rain came, changing that canopy above the Earth that was protective and allowed people to live longer to populate the Earth, and that the rotation around the sun was different enough to be different accounting of years. Now, I do think lives are longer. I think that's part of why there were dinosaurs because reptiles kept living, for instance. There were creatures identified as dinosaurs. Um, I don't think, by the way, that you know, there's a line of thought that today's dinosaurs are birds, that dinosaurs became birds because they found they needed to fly and do different things like eat fish out of the sea instead of attacking people on mountainsides and such. Thank you. And the um, so I don't think that dinosaurs suddenly decide to form wings and feathers. I think that's a little bit more of a stretch than I would expect of anything. And I think God created birds and God created land creatures and God created sea creatures to account for that. So now if we look down to verse 18 of Genesis 9, and I'll wrap up here because we're out of time. Sons of Noah came out of the ark where Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. Then down to chapter 10, this is the account of Shem and Ham and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. Okay, and then you can read all the Japhethites, the Hamites, and then down over, uh, that'd be Japhethites at verse two, the Hamites from verse six following, and then the Semites, um, which are the Shemites also, but we call them Semites in modern language, uh, going down to 21 and, and further. So there is a proposed, way that these three sons split and had different, what we would identify as different racial groups in the world. And that was that Ham veered toward what we now call Africa. And that I believe was beginning to separate with the Red Seas uh, split in the land, for instance. Uh, and then that the uh, Japhethites went up more toward Europe and the Shemites went, or Semites went more out toward um, the Far East and um, and over into the what we would then later call the Orient or Asia or whatever way you want to term that based on history. So the challenge to that, I find, and we don't really have time on that. We just lost connection, I believe. Does that mean I'm done? Okay. So the so the uh, something either that or something just crawled out of this earpiece and crawled into my brain. The um, but the challenge I find with that, if you say, well, the Hamites went to Africa, is that look over here at verse six, the sons of Ham, Cush, and then let's look over at uh, uh, verse eight. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a great, my, a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Easiest way to get that reputation. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Erech, Akkad and Kalna and Shinar, in Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Rehobothur, Kala, and Reason, which is between Nineveh and Kala. is a great city. So if he built Nineveh, that's not anywhere close to Africa, for instance. And so I don't think it breaks down to that simple in terms of the mixing of the people. I think you've got to look at the Tower of Babel and the dividing of people because of language separation. And I think that because we read that later, the that um, there was a guy that lived in the time of the separation of the earth, which is in chapter 10. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, 10, Peleg, 
uh, verse 25, these sons were born to Eber. One, these are Semites. One was named Peleg because in his time, the earth was divided, his brother is Zoktan. If you look at that ongoing division, I believe it was several generations down and that people were on each continent as the continuing spread occurred. That continuing spread could have altered the life of people a bit more because of the way I'm proposing it altered the rotation of the earth and the earth on its axis. And so that could have taken a while. That's the long answer to answer the age range. Thank you for all the comments, questions. I'm gonna wrap up this study today. We'll probably, uh, well, we'll do a different study. Sorry, next week, if you can join us. We may do spiritual gifts, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about what to do next. Yes, this is gonna be it, because I really, I think anything beyond this on creation would just be repetitive. Uh, next week, if you have questions, if you want to jot them down or something, I'd be happy maybe to address a few more questions. We didn't have much time for that. But I think I want to get back to a, just pure scriptural study of, you know, what we can do in life as uh, Christian people in our community. So we probably do spiritual gifts or something similar, living in the spirit. We talked about the Holy Spirit quite a bit, didn't talk so much about living in the spirit, and we'll go from there.